Um, please be mindful of that as you um, interact with, with us today. Um, you're welcome to, throughout the presentation, use the chat box to ask questions. I will be reviewing the questions throughout uh, Dr. Prabhu's presentation, and we'll have a, a nice solid 15 to 20 plus minutes at least of question and answer time at the end of his presentation. Uh, so lots of time to have conversation and dialogue, lots of time to, to talk about all the things that you are here to talk about. If you are interested in uh, following us on Instagram, you can see we are here at, at Duke Center for Misophonia. Uh, and our website address for the Duke Center is misophonia.duke.edu. Uh, again, welcome everyone. This is a snapshot of, of our team. We do research and we train and teach and provide care for people with misophonia. Uh, we are dedicated to this as an academic medical center, uh, center for misophonia, one of the few in the world that, uh, that does this work. Uh, and we are really grateful to have uh, a, a team of people that help make sure all that we do is done uh, as best as possible. And today, Lisa Kelly is with us as our team research lead. And thank you, Lisa, for all of your work on the back end of all of these webinars and, and everything else we do coordinating. Chris Edwards is a close colleague of ours who I believe is here with us today from soquiet.org. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Brout has been critical in helping us with uh, really getting all of this webinar series uh, moving and, and happening. Uh, and she is not with us today, unfortunately. Uh, but thank you to Jennifer and thank you to the Seamer team and to all of you who have supported us over the years financially with uh, generous gifts to make sure we exist. We would not be here without you. We literally wouldn't be doing any of this without uh, your generosity. Uh, and finally, thank you to everyone who advocates supporting research and educating the public and clinicians and for providing interest in and enthusiasm about treating misophonia. Uh, we are all in this, what Chris Edwards has labeled the misosphere. We are all in this misosphere together. We are a community and we are um, all very supportive of each other. So thank you to everyone who is a part of this growing community. Uh, today, we are going to uh, hear from a wonderful colleague of ours at Duke, who we are collaborating with and absolutely just delighted to have here. We're very proud to have Dr. Prashanth Prabhu, uh, who is from the All in India Institute of Speech and Hearing. Uh, he's going to present misophonia and audiologist perspective. Uh, and Prashanth, if you would like to go ahead and I will stop sharing and you can take it away from here. Thank you. Dr. Rosenthal for this kind introduction and thank you for the entire Duke team for inviting me to be a part of this uh, webinar series. So I'll quickly share my screen. So I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Yes. So. Yes. So thank you everyone for joining in for this uh, presentation on misophonia from an audiologist's perspective. So, so this presentation where I'll be talking about things where as an audiologist, how we can help uh, or how we play a role in uh, helping those who are suffering from misophonia. So quickly talk about me. So I'm working as an assistant professor of audiology uh, at the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, India. And I'm also an academic editor for journals like PLOS One, Frontiers in Audiology and Autology, and also a member of International Misophonia Research Network. I've also certified for specialized rehabilitation program for management of tinnitus, hyperacusis, and misophonia based on cognitive behavioral therapy. So to quickly talk about my team, so my majority of the work with respect to misophonia was done with uh, Ms. Sajna Ariel. So currently she is a PhD student at University of Texas, Austin, and she was also a recipient of the So Quiet Misophonia Student Grant with which we actually initiated many studies related to uh, misophonia. And I'm happy to share that we are collaborating with the Duke University also and uh, uh, working on misophonia research. 
my other colleagues uh, at uh, in india are dr nisha kevi i miss rishita adlin suraj and uh, aparna so all these are my dissertation or master students who are working in the area of uh, misophonia the agenda for today is to talk about understanding misophonia from an audiology crown so how we can understand or how the auditory pathways involved in misophonia and role of audiologist in terms of assessment so how audiological assessment is important or how it can help uh, in individuals with misophonia and i'll talk a bit on role of audiologists for in the management or the treatment of misophonia and a bit about the future direction so back in may 2023 we had the a care event of misophonia where conversation about research for everyone so where i gave a talk on similar topic of audiology and uh, misophonia following up with that we had another presentation from uh, sajna on misophonia and audiology and uh, so quiet uh, science session and uh, all these i um, mean my video um, in my talk is available in the duke website and also in the so quiet uh, youtube channel and also the sajna's uh, talk is on the so quiet channel so what i'm trying to present here is something slightly different from what uh, i have already talked about uh, in uh, these two i mean this um, previous presentation so that i have the important points i am just carrying forward but majority would be something new that you can uh, look forward so for the other details i mean majority of my work or my studies related to uh, misophonia and audiology can be found in the previous videos so quickly as audiologists we we work on the hearing sense and we are involved in hearing and also with respect to balance and uh, we work on assessment and treatment for those with hearing and balance disorders we are trained professionals to diagnose treat monitor hearing loss tinnitus uh, it can add hyperacusis misophonia also and balance related issues so how we can a role in misophonia so misophonia is uh, a disorder which has multiple dimensions where it has a psychological component it has a neurological involvement and a possible audiological involvement as well so we have to look look misophonia from different angles and then uh, help them and you know uh, combine and try to understand misophonia so till now we don't have any standard you know criteria i mean still misophonia is not under dsm as well so we don't have a strict diagnostic criteria but there has been attempt done to uh, come out with possible diagnostic criteria for misophonia and there is a uh, attempt made to uh, talk about the definition of misophonia as well so i'll quickly talk about this because in the audience there may be individuals with misophonia parents with uh, children with misophonia or those who want to understand misophonia so this is a diagnostic criteria proposed by the schroder et al in 2013 so these are the six diagnostic criteria that they have reported that if a person is having these criteria so uh, all these criteria if they satisfy then possibly they can be diagnosed or they can be you know uh, suggested that they might be having a uh, misophonia so because still now you know you uh, many places people don't even diagnose misophonia or it's very difficult to say you have miso misophonia so unless we have a label unless we have a diagnosis we cannot you know move ahead with respect to management providing facilities etc so this can be one of the tool that we can use where we can look into these criterion and suggest maybe this could uh, this could lead to uh, i mean this could be indicating a possible misophonia okay so not reading it i can share the um, article and the diagnostic criteria so you can go through it you can read about it so basically talking about you know uh, the presence of or anticipation of a specific sound uh, all these triggers that lead to different uh, emotional problems or you know different physical sensations and it is not explained by other disorders so this was the definition that has been provided or a diagnostic criteria that was provided by schroder et al so most i mean recently there was a consensus definition of misophonia given by swedo et al so there was a group of uh, uh, experts who are working in the misophonia 
came together and they did a Delphi kind of a study where they tried to come up with a consensus definition how misophonia can be explained better. So according to them, misophonia is a disorder of decreased you know, sound tolerance to specific sounds or stimuli associated with such sounds. So these stimuli are known as triggers and these are experienced as unpleasant or distressing and tend to evoke strong negative emotional, physiological and behavioral response that are not seen in other people. So misophonic responses do not seem to be elicited by the loudness, but rather than by a specific pattern or meaning to the individual. It's not the loudness per se, but the actual sound, the quality of the sound, which actually uh, causes the distress. So the trigger stimuli are often repetitive primarily, but not exclusively include stimuli generated by another individual, especially those produced by the human body. So this is continuing with that. So once a stimul trigger has Stimulus is detected. Individuals with misophonia may have difficulty distracting themselves, so they will have to react, and that can affect their quality of life in terms of social, occupational, or academic functioning. So the expression of misophonic symptoms varies as the severity, which ranges from mild to severe. So we can have individuals with slight symptoms to very severe symptoms as well. So some individuals with misophonia are aware of their reactions, but some are you know, some are not aware of that also. So misophonia symptoms are typically first observed in childhood or in early adolescence. So this is the consensus statement that people have agreed into. So this definition, if it fits into you, so you may be suffering from misophonia. So we can use that criteria. And they've also talked about the reactions to misophonia triggers, influence on reactions, functional impairments, relationship with other conditions, and they've talked about the misophonia trigger. So that's again an interesting article to read and understand uh, misophonia. So this, with this basic information that I just wanted to confer, I want to also highlight uh, studies done by uh, Kumar et al. So Dr. Sukhpinder Kumar did a lot of studies with respect to imaging to prove that there is you know, a path evidence to say that there are abnormal activity or abnormal neural connections or there's a difference in the misophonic brain compared to a person with uh, you know not who is non-misophonic so for example so there are two pictures that i just quickly want to show you so which means that if you see in the left uh, figure here so the left interior insula so they say it is more active in individuals with misophonia compared to control group so this is an area which is responsible for our emotions the emotion regulation the control happens here so if the auditory cortex has abnormal connections or extra connections as you can see there are additional activity or extra activity and this happens whenever they're exposed to triggers in the right side we have a figure where even you know, in the resting state, when there are, when there are no triggers, also we see you know a slightly higher activity. So considering that there is definitely a brain basis uh, for misophonia, so suggesting that the the abnormal connections that gets established could possibly lead to misophonia. I've put up this slide so in, to say that it's people might think that misophonia is just you know psych. They are they are thinking or you know they're it's more psychological. It may not have. Uh, specific organic pathology or organic etiology as such, but there are studies which prove that there are abnormal connections in the brain that may be, you know, the reason for the misophonia that they're experiencing. On similar lines, we try to identify is there uh, how to understand misophonia from an audiology perspective. So we did a systematic review and we tried to come up with a neuroaudiological model from an audit because they are hearing sound through the auditory pathway. So there has to be some abnormality in the pathway. Is there abnormality in the pathway that could be leading to the uh, pathology is what we try to understand. So the model looks complicated. So I'll try to uh, decipher it quickly. Uh, so what happens is this is our ear. So we start to hear through the ears and through the auditory nerve, it goes to the, um, it scores of the auditory cortex or the brain. It, it uh, ultimately the perception happens in the auditory cortex. So before it reaches the auditory cortex, so there is something called as a sensory gating that occurs. So what is sensory gating is, so it's like a gate. Gate allows some people to go in and it uh, does not allow some people or uh, you know some individuals to not go in. So it's like some sensory input that is going. So sensory information has to get stopped. Okay, not entire information, whatever we are experiencing, whatever senses we are perceiving, all of it does not go to 
for perception or whatever we are hearing everything doesn't go there would be a gating where some amount of information goes in and the rest doesn't go so the gate uh, the gate prevents the uh, rest of the information from going in so that would be affected or that could be possibly affected in individuals with misophonia where extra information is going in there is we call it as lack of inhibition the information is not getting reduced or the, the inhibition is not getting controlled if i can put it like that so in individuals with misophonia so that may be the reason or triggering uh, misophonia and so once that happens it activates uh, other systems in the brain i mean i talked about the insula where or uh, the limbic system where it's responsible for emotions so once your emotion the trigger sounds would start creating negative emotions in your body so because of that what could happen is it activates another system in the body called the autonomic nervous system which is responsible for a fight or a flight response that is it keeps your body completely awake or attentive because of that there will be extra you know bodily reactions that would come in and extra mental uh, you know your body becomes completely alert so any trigger sound you react such that it's a threatening sound so imagine there is a uh, there is a danger that you uh, you thought so what would happen is your body tries to move away from the danger so your autonomic nervous system completely becomes active so once that gets active it gets active once it you uh, know identifies a threat so the triggers would uh, you know consider for individuals with misophonia the triggers would sound like a threat and that because of that we start to get you know uh, body becomes more active you get all these bodily sensations etc so the sound starts processing at this level the sensory gating is something that could be affected so that leads to uh, abnormal perception at the auditory cortex that's lead to hyperactivation of the limbic system and the autonomic nervous system leading to the triggers and the negative emotions so this becomes like a conditioned reflex okay so triggers is causing negative emotions because of that the physical reactions would happening and this becomes like a cycle so because of that maybe the uh, misophonia is occurring so there is a non classical pathway not the traditional pathway but the additional pathway in the auditory system so that could be uh, leading to misophonia so i'm uh, it can be too technical if you're not understand you can always ask me questions so later i'll be happy to explain this again all these gets activated and that's how uh, you possibly here tinnitus is one of the hypothesis or the model that uh, we proposed so one of the major thing that i want to talk about is how we can do an assessment or is there a need for an audiological assessment for those who are suffering from uh, misophonia okay so let's try to understand that so why there is a need or yes because there are several conditions or i can put it like several comorbid conditions associated with misophonia so where audiologists would play a role so for example literature suggests that 60% of patients with tinnitus also have misophonia so misophonia can be associated with tinnitus so those who are suffering from tinnitus so or uh, tinnitus is nothing but a ringing sensation so they may also have misophonia so that is one hypothesis and recent studies show that they did a study where among individuals with misophonia 2% reported of tinnitus and 1% reported hyperacusis hyperacusis is loud sounds or you know moderate level sounds are perceived abnormally loud so for example you know somebody uh, even speaking or you know some some sounds which are normally tolerable for everyone but that becomes intolerable to them it, they they get irritated they get agitated so they get they get emotion emotional reactions to sounds and that is hyperacusis and the study this study so shows that 1% of them have hyperacusis 3% of them had unilateral hearing loss so that's another point that i want to highlight is those with uh, misophonia may also have hearing loss there could be a small percentage of them who may have unilateral hearing loss so that can be assessed by an audiologist to compare okay and uh, the asymmetry in the auditory perception between the ears could also be a reason for you know the abnormal activation that could have started so if especially if it is unilateral what can happen is it may go undetected so uh, sometimes they may not realize that they have a unilateral hearing loss so considering that getting an audiological evaluation in that sense uh, uh, would be important so another study ensler also said that almost 17 of them reported hearing problems 14 of them had tinnitus and 55% of them 55 of them at hyperacusis so considering that it is important to rule out 
whether they have tinnitus, whether they have hyperacusis. So there are ways in which we can assess the presence of hyperacusis or, you know, the, uh, confirm the presence of tinnitus as well. So that can be done by an audiologist to rule out that it is a pure misophonia not associated with any other audiological conditions, no hearing loss, no tinnitus and no hyperacusis. So this is something which we can rule out with an audiological assessment. So the trigger sound for misophonia often have a spectrum that is dominated by high frequency components. So that's a study which says that mostly the triggers have a higher frequency. So audiologically, we can assess, do they have, you know, have specific sensitivity difference at these higher frequencies only. So that can also possibly explain. So all these are giving reasons why, uh, you know, uh, misophonia could be occurring. So that can be provided by an audiologist. So strong concentration of energy in the 2.5 to 5.5 kilohertz are associated with auditory perception unpleasantness for normal subjects. So normal people reported that these are the frequencies where, you know, the trigger sounds are more, more present or these sounds are more unpleasant. So we can do an assessment specifically at these frequencies and confirm that they have any issues in these. What biological tests are usually recommended considering present research evidence that is available? There's definitely a pure tone audiometry rule out they have any hearing loss or they can also do a tinnitus evaluation to confirm whether the tinnitus is present or absent and then we do something called as an uncomfortable level so we find out intensity level where the sound becomes uncomfortable so that's an audiological test that we do so that will help us in differentiating hyperacusis and uh, uh, misophonia because individuals with hyperacusis will have an abnormally low uncomfortable level. That means if an, I can tolerate a 100 decibel sound, somebody with hyperacusis can't even tolerate a 60 or a 70 decibel sound. So that's what is uncomfortable level. So I can audiologically measure this and confirm whether the person is having hyperacusis or not. Because initially when the Astrobof uh, uh, you know, uh, named misophonia. So what uh, majority of them, I mean, he called it under the umbrella term of uh, sound tolerance problems where majority of them have hyperacusis and misophonia. So misophonia didn't came into picture maybe because it was not differentiated between hyperacusis and misophonia. And there can be a uh, co-occurrence also that is those with severe uh, hyperacusis also have misophonia. So there can definitely be co-occurrence. So I have seen clinically also many people having that. So an audiological test would definitely help Here's us finished. differentiate that. Here's, did you see your tree? So the asymmetrical hearing threshold level or ULL. So what can happen is, another thing that can happen is the asymmetry between the ears. So between the ears, we may have difference. And between the ears, we may also have a difference in the hearing thresholds and also difference in terms of the uncomfortable level. So that can be something uh, which may also be a reason for misophonia. So that also can be assessed if you do an audiological test. The large difference between the ULL might indicate some abnormality in the monaural pathway. So this and majority of the studies also show and majority of you so with misophonia also will say that they have normal hearing. So majority of them would have normal hearing sensitivity or they'll have normal audiogram. But there could be a hidden auditory impairment. So there could be subtle auditory abnormalities in the brainstem or in the cortical areas. Okay, and so that we have been doing several research with respect to psychoacoustical tests, auditory based cognitive tests, and the test which checks for brainstem and cortical processing. So we have been finding some subtle abnormalities uh, there as well. So especially in the cortical level and also in some of the psychoacoustical tests and uh, where the task becomes more difficult. So we need to do most audiological tests because it can be hidden. I mean, it may not be show an obvious hearing loss, but there could be a hidden abnormality that can be seen similar to like how it is there in tinnitus can also be there in misophonia. So most studies on these lines are essential, but right now uh, these are not mandatory tests that I would recommend, but getting an audiogram and getting their uncomfortable level tested will help us, you know, differentiating whether it is uh, hyperacusis associated with misophonia or pure misophonia.
So that's what uh, has been reported recently as well. So in, they are assessing individuals with tinnitus and hyperacusis. It's important to screen for mesophonia. So whenever we get patients, we should always try to screen. So whenever the ULL is abnormally low and handicap score is high, then we should suspect possible uh, mesophonia. So this will help to uh, identify if there is a comorbidity and plan our therapy appropriately. So talking in brief about role of cardiologists in management, how we can play a role in managing individuals with mesophonia. So treatment definitely is a team approach as I've talked before, it is a com combined approach that we have to do uh, with a psychologist, with a neurologist, you know, with uh, maybe other professionals who are also working or helping individuals with uh, uh, mesophonia. So it's always a team approach and audiologists can also be a part of the team. So how we can help as audiologists, how we can help is what I'll quickly touch upon. So what is reported is audiologists who are specialized in management of tinnitus and hyperacusis can also provide counseling and sound therapy for those who are with, who are suffering from uh, uh, misophonia. So that is some uh, that is something which audiologists can offer and or along with that or, or there is something called as an audiologist delivered CBT as well, cognitive behavioral therapy are typically provided by uh, psychologists, but audiologists who is trained in that can also provide cognitive behavioral therapy for management of misophonia. And so what do we do in counseling is basically explaining about the condition. So we can explain from audiology perspective, there are any comorbidities and all those we can definitely explain the results of the audiological test, if it is normal or if there is any uh, associated complaints and identifying and ruling out the comorbid condition such as hyperacusis and explaining what is mesophonia is something which as audiologists can also do and uh, help individuals with mesophonia. With respect to sound therapy, so Jastaboff has provided the mesophonia retraining therapy where he talks about four different protocols. So I don't want to talk about all the four, but what I prefer or something which I recommend, which I've been using for my uh, clinical population as well, is what I'll quickly talk about. Is when we talk about sound therapy, what he recommends is the protocol for category one, where the patient has full control over the selection of sound, its level and duration. So what is recommended here is the protocol where the patient is asked to select the sound they like. So they can select any sound that they like and they have to listen to it attentively, you know, not in the background, but listen to it attentively once or twice a day for 15 to 30 minutes and gradually increase in intensity in a very slow step. So that's what uh, we can, it is recommended in sound therapy. It is, uh, you know, people use maskers like how it is used in tinnitus. So where they use white noise or other kinds of noises. So that is something where uh, it is not pleasant. And what is reported is we should try to select something which they like, any music, any sound that they like listening to for 15 to 30 minutes. It is totally up to them. The first point, as we say, they decide the sound. It is not, need not be it's the same sound always. They can decide the sound, they can select the intensity and they can also select the duration. So approximately 15 to 30 minutes, they have to keep listening and we'll be gradually increasing the intensity slightly, you know, ar around 10 to 15 decibels. So when we are doing this or why, why we are doing this is it has two goals. It will create a positive association with sounds. Okay. So the general, as we have discussed, there is a lot of negativity associated with sounds. So when they listen to their favorite music, so they get to, I mean, they get that positive emotions in them. So that can help in breaking the, uh, the cycle associated with the negative connection. So they start to associate that sounds can also be positive. Sounds can also produce positive emotions because their mind is always towards triggers and sound is something which individuals with misophonia try to hate. So because of that, this can help and uh, gradually increasing the level can help them to get habituated. So during, so the whole idea is it gets generalized, the positive association for these sounds may spread and generalize to the other sound as well. So this is something uh, which, uh, which I recommend because this protocol is completely safe because patient fully controls what he wants to listen and he's not getting exposed to any of the offensive sounds or you know any trigger sound. It is not exposure therapy. In the later protocol, he talks about exposure, but I haven't used it and now there is no literature support that it will help. But uh, this is something which I feel can 
as an audiologist, we can provide, we can select all this, we can provide uh, this support along with the traditional, you know, the psychotherapy, psychological intervention or the cognitive behavioral therapy that they may be taking uh, along with, uh, with the psychologist. So this is something that audiologists, I think, can definitely offer along with the additional therapies that they are taking. In case of coexisting hyper hyperacusis, this is the only protocol for hyperacusis and misophonia. This is one of the best protocol that has been recommended by Yastubov. So quickly talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy is provided typically by psychologists, but also has been done by audiologists as well. So there have been studies reported by us and his colleagues where they say uh, CBT can be done, but again, the, there are lacks of studies, so we don't have any randomized control studies and other studies to prove that it will benefit, but this is something which can help because, so to, I'm not going into detail of how cognitive behavioral therapy works, so the whole idea is uh, we are focusing on something different, so to, to say it in a layman term or make you understand how cognitive behavioral therapy works, I have a example so, so i i don't know too much of baseball but i'll try giving a baseball example considering the uh, audience from the us uh, okay so imagine you have a pitcher who is uh, trying to pitch and you have a striker i don't know you use striker who is trying to play so his entire attention should be on the ball on the picture how the ball would be whether it's a curve ball or the fast ball etc so but if his attention goes towards the audience you know the audience are uh, or making some noise or there is somebody in the audience if the attention shifts what would happen is would be out so that's the whole uh, so with this what i try to say is individuals with misophonia have their entire attention towards the triggers how the trigger occurs uh, you know what i mean what's the intensity of the trigger what the new triggers and all that the focus is not on what should be done okay the focus is not on the picture that is not on the uh, the focus is on the audience audience is nothing but the trigger so we should be we, we are focusing on something others so what should we be focusing on we should be focusing on what is this triggering triggers causing? What are the thoughts that comes because of the trigger? What are the emotions that I get because of the triggers? Okay, so, so what is under our control is the thoughts that comes out. Okay, because uh, triggers is not under our control, but what is our, under our control is the, uh, uh, is the thought process. So this is the thought process. Okay, the picture is a thought process, audience are the uh, triggers. But if you want to tackle the ball or tackle misophonia, so what you need to do is you need to concentrate on the thoughts or uh, rather than on the triggers. So to simply put what is... Um, Okay, so we call it as a CBT triangle. So what is a CBT triangle is, so the triggers are outside this triangle. So once we get a trigger, we get the thoughts. Thoughts are nothing but what we think. And that thought would feel, come, I mean, you know, generate feelings. That feelings will lead to different actions or behaviors. So once we break this, you know, once we control the thoughts, we can control our feelings, we can control our actions. So there will be, there. Are, there's a strategic way or there's a, uh, uh, standard procedure which we follow where we change the thoughts that are evoked because of the trigger so that they are more rational and not negative automatic thoughts that come in so that will actually help them uh, or cope better and you know uh, have a better quality of life so this is how uh, cognitive behavioral therapy would work so there was a recent uh, published i think last i mean this month uh, a systematic review on treatment methods for misophonia there has been there are very little research done on this, but people, we want to know what does research say. Clinically, people are doing so many things, but nothing is reported. Unless we have research evidence, we cannot say that this is something which will definitely work. Okay, so what does this research say? So it was done, there was only one RCT. Okay, there's only one randomized control trial, run, only one label trial, and there were 31 case studies or case series. Okay, from that, cognitive behavioral therapy has been one which was most utilized and found to be most effective for reduction of misophonia uh, with one RCT done and there are several case studies. So other approaches did not have so much of research control. So that's what, so right now the evidence says that CBT is something that can 
uh, help individuals, but other approaches may help, but we need to you know, carry out a, a study. So from an audiology perspective, we can definitely uh, help in providing the sound therapy and those who are qualified in cognitive behavioral therapy, they can also provide uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy along with a positive uh, sound therapy that I just discussed. In terms of future, People are working with respect to neuromodulation techniques. So what is neuromodulation? I showed you the brain image where there is extra neural activity. So what we can do is we can give a transcranial current or transcranial magnet where we can give current or magnetic energy where we, if we identify the specific areas which are hyperactive, uh, we can reduce or can inhibit the brain activity. So this has been tried in, this has been researched in tinnitus, hyperacusis. So people have been working uh, in this area, even in individuals with misophonia as well. So this is something which is definitely promising considering the pathophysiology, uh, uh, attending to that directly may help individuals with uh, misophonia. So let's hope uh, uh, more positive research comes out of it. People are still working even in tinnitus and hyperacusis. We don't have uh, foolproof uh, parameters that will definitely work, but we, there is research that is ongoing. So hopefully we'll have uh, research, especially in uh, mitophonia as well. So there's something called as vagal nerve as well. We published a research uh, where we suggested that maybe these uh, neuromodulation techniques are something that may help. So people are working also in terms of genetics and gene therapy, so that may help. So all these are the future methods that are, are coming up. So maybe uh, audiologists and psychiatrists, other professionals who are working in this area may uh, help, may do more work in this and they can also help uh, individuals with misophonia. So these are the things that I just wanted to talk about. To conclude, we need to create more awareness. We need definitely a, a better diagnostic criteria where we can understand misophonia better. Assessment from an audiologist, especially to rule out auditory based disorder or comorbidity with hyperacusis. And with respect to management, we can be a part of the team where we can help uh, help more patients with misophonia. And But however, whatever I said, most studies are definitely essential where uh, we prove the efficacy of the treatment method. So once it is more research proven, uh, then we can definitely suggest such techniques for the treatment and management of misophonia. So, so I'll try to answer as many questions as possible in this uh, session. And uh, you can also, if you have any questions, you can also email me or you can, I'm, I'm there even in several social media you can reach out to me. I'll be very happy to uh, discuss more about it. So, so thank you for the opportunity. So let's uh, discuss about I mean, whatever questions you may have and uh, try to understand the misophonia better. Thank you everyone for your patient listening. Thank you for that. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Prabhu. This is um, exactly what we were hoping to do is have a really thorough overview of audiology and misophonia from the brain to assessment to intervention. Uh, and you did it all. So thank you so much for being for being so comprehensive in such a short amount of time. We, we do have some questions and I will encourage people here to uh, go ahead and ask additional questions in the chat. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and moderate here a couple, a couple of questions. The first question, uh, Dr. Prabhu, comes up here. I'm scrolling on my screen. Give me just a moment. And there it is. Okay, so going back to one of your first points about misophonia and the brain, you talked a bit about abnormal sensory gating and the importance of sensory gating. So the question here is, what do we know or what don't we know about the correlation between misophonia and abnormal sensory gating? I, th I think the question here is less theoretical and it's really more, is there any science that we can point to uh, about sensory gating and misophonia? And if not, what do we need to do about that? Yeah. So we don't have any specific studies targeting on uh, sensory gating, uh, but we have we can mostly imply from the uh, brain studies, especially uh, done by Kumar and his colleagues, where uh, if we are saying abnormal uh, neural activation in the brain, so there has to be a pathway where something would be triggering, where uh, so something is 
not controlling. So considering that, what is uh, um, what is suggested is there is a possible uh, sensory gating abnormality. So because sensory gating abnormality has also been uh, suggested in individuals with tinnitus and hyperacusis, where we see that you know uh, the reason for hearing uh, sounds in your ears could also be because of abnormal sensory gating. There has been uh, no specific studies and there are no uh, ideal way of uh, studying as well unless we do some invasive studies. So based on the uh, imaging studies right now that we have, so we can imply that the extra neural activation or the extra activity in the brain that we have is possibly because of lack of inhibition or uh, you know, the lack of uh, sensory gating mechanism that could be present. So right now, just an implication. And uh, I mean, again, if we are studying, it has to be through uh, you know the invasive studies where you put electrodes, measure the activity and the different parts of the brain and you know, quantify it and check it. Thank you. So it sounds like in some, there is theoretical reason to believe that sensory gating could be relevant, and there's indirect scientific evidence that supports that idea, uh, but there isn't any direct causal link yet studied scientifically, nor is there any uh, study that has shown peripherally outside of the brain to use methods that could be indicative of, of, of sensory gating phenomena. So those, those are studies that need to be done. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. So these are the studies where uh, we need to try doing studies where we can understand sensory gating, especially in individuals with misophonia better. Yes. Thank you for that. There's a question that came in before the webinar today that I'm going to go ahead and read to you. It's the, the very top of the, the chat box. The question is, is there evidence that hearing aids that provide white noise or other sounds continuously while the wearer engages in life activities enhances coping skills, or more importantly, perhaps support overcoming the responses to the trigger sounds. And the kind of additional questions are, would custom hearing aids be more effective than popular earbuds? What would explain their effectiveness or lack of effectiveness? Would the volume of the trigger sounds reduce effectiveness? So lots of questions in there to, to, to think about, but they all come from this question about are the sound generators that are sometimes recommended by audiologists, are they in any way scientifically supported? And kind of how would they work best? Yeah, so answering to the first part, uh, we don't have at present any scientific evidence to prove that the sound generators or the maskers that are provided can help individuals uh, with misophonia. So we don't have any uh, research evidence to show that it can uh, you know, provide help. But logically thinking, if we are giving a sound generator, it may uh, partially mask the triggers that are there around and uh, that indirectly may help the uh, may help in coping but uh, practically or you know the clinically uh, from my experience to answer those uh, especially from even from a tinnitus angle so i look we, because we see more patients with tinnitus and maskers are provided uh, more for them as well so what is recommended or what is uh, reported is if the maskers are producing something where you know you have your soothing sounds or something where the sounds are more positive rather than uh, something more noise like so that that can prove beneficial so right now uh, using a earbud or a masker which which is provided uh, as a sound generator to mask uh, the trigger sounds may not really benefit individuals with misophonia from a personal experience and there's no research evidence also to prove that you know this would definitely uh, benefit but what i recommend when from another angle if i look at it is also using a hearing aid can be effective okay so what can be hearing aid in uh, how will it help is basically uh, if I have a hearing loss, what our brain does is it tries to compensate for our hearing loss by producing extra gain. Brain realizes that, okay, I'm not hearing some frequencies. Let me try to produce extra brain activity. So if I'm using a hearing aid, so then that can actually help uh, uh, you know, overcome this extra central gain. But that is 
uh, recommended only if you have a hearing loss. But those majority of the individuals with misophonia do not have hearing loss. But if you have concomitant hearing loss associated with misophonia, so maybe I would recommend a hearing aid, but preferably not with a masker, but masker, uh, rather than a masker listening to a positive sound outside through a speaker, you know, or, uh, or even through an app where you have, you're listening to your favorite music, that can provide a better masker rather than the sound generator producing a white noise. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's It sounds like in some, there's not clear scientific evidence one way or the other for the role of um, sound generating devices as part of treating misophonia. And yet at the same time, even though there's not clear scientific evidence, there, there may be for some people reasons to, to use them uh, and to talk with their audiologist about the particulars of how to use them or if they would like to use them. It sounds like it's one of those things that might require a, a conversation with, with an audiologist in detail. Yes, I agree. So you just, uh, depending upon your problem specifically, so an audiologist can actually provide a better advice. Yes. Right, right. Okay. And I have a, a question here I'm seeing that's towards the end of the question so far, but it, it's a really important one because it brings us back to the beginning. Uh, so I'm going to jump to it. And the question is, I need a clearer understanding of diagnosing misophonia. Kindly repeat. So I, I think this person just asking for you to maybe repeat again in, in a way that you, you'd like to, how, how to understand the diagnosis itself. Yeah, so yes, that's an important question. Is how do we diagnose misophonia? So right now it is again, again a tricky one. So we, uh, uh, so how I would diagnose or how I would uh, uh, understand that the person would definitely have misophonia is um, we don't have a specific test, but the the Schroeder's diagnostic criteria that I discussed, where we have all those six points where he talk where they talk about the you know the expression of misophonia how I mean what are the symptoms and how uh, how it is uh, defined so i use the uh, diagnostic criteria by schroeder and also the consensus recent consensus definition that is uh, given by Swedo et al so these are the uh, two things that uh, i use if they fall into that bracket i i mean i am confident of diagnosing the patient as misophonia to understand the severity of the problem we have several questionnaires that are available to you know confirm whether they have mild uh, no moderate or other severity of the misophonia but in terms of diagnosing i use the criterion right now and if they uh, satisfy those criteria i think i'm confident in considering them as uh, having misophonia as as a point of uh, i guess clarity are you able to literally diagnose in a diagnostic system misophonia? Or do you mean that you diagnose in a kind of a more um, casual way? Yeah, so right now we don't, I mean, we misophonia is not considered as a diagnosis yet, even in the uh, DSM uh, manual. So we, we cannot like clearly diagnose and write as uh, misophonia. I can put it like a more of a provisional diagnosis or, you know, I can put it like uh, a possible misophonia. So unless, uh, unless this comes under the bracket of the actual diagnosis, so then it is difficult. But for, for my clinical practice and for understanding uh, understanding that I can, you know, I use that criteria. Yeah, and that, that's similar to what uh, I do as a clinician, and I think I think it makes sense to clarify that that there is no diagnosis of misophonia. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist in any literal way, and so we actually aren't able to diagnose misophonia in the true sense of the term. Diagnose. There is no diagnosis to diagnose. Yes. No, literally, medically, scientifically, clinically accepted diagnosis. But yet we can assess. We may not be able to diagnose, but we can assess. We can assess and we can create treatment plans and help people even without having the official diagnosis. Now, we can get into the particulars of billing and insurance and all of that, and that will vary country by country and place by place. 
But I think that that is an important distinction. I, I have a question here that um, comes uh, from someone who who's bringing us to the point of the presentation where you were talking about CBT and co cognitive behavioral therapy uh, and focusing on the point about controlling your thoughts and trying to change your thoughts as a way to change downstream emotions and, and physiology and, and behavior. So the question is, in my experience, I can't control my thoughts. Rather, I can listen to them and recognize when they are helpful or unhelpful thoughts, then move away from the unhelpful thoughts. I don't think we can literally control our thoughts. So any comments you have about how audiologists, how audiologists might look at CBT uh, in the in this sense of can you, you know, can you change them or not? Can can you control them or not based on this comment? Yeah, so so that's an interesting comment. Yes. So uh we, as I said, definitely we cannot control our thoughts. So as in like the thoughts are generally automatic. So whenever you get the trigger, so the thoughts automatically come in. So what we do in CBT or what is uh, generally done is, so you identify or you predict the thoughts that you, you would be getting because of the triggers. And you, I mean, what, on what I was trained or what we do, what, what we did, uh, what we try is uh, you consciously make an attempt to replace those thoughts, not at the time, you know, not, so whenever you uh, have the thought, you try to replace it. Whenever you get a negative thought, you try to, you know, kind of replace it with more rational thoughts. You uh, pre-think or you list out the possible negative thoughts that you'd be getting, analyze it, and then, you know, try to change those thoughts into more rational and more uh, more correct thoughts uh, because there could be uh, thoughts that are more generalized. You know, there are thoughts that may be, uh, that may not be appropriate. So, once you do it consciously I mean cognitive behavioral therapy in the stages where you're doing it consciously, we are trying to understand the thoughts and then you're consciously trying to replace it. So then the, you're not doing it, uh, you know, changing it voluntarily, but the brain, once it learns it, whenever the thoughts are coming, it tries to replace it uh, at an unconscious level. So uh, that's, that's a possible explanation as in like, we are not consciously trying to change the thoughts, but we are, we are trying our best to you know, replace the thoughts offline, if I can put it like that, and then the brain learns it, and then uh, you know, it will change its thoughts when the actual negative thoughts stream in. So I think in that way, CBT uh, can help where we are identifying the thoughts and we are making a conscious effort to you know, try to replace it with uh, more rational thoughts. Okay, and I'm gonna jump in here and add my two cents uh, as someone who is a, a person who regularly teaches and trains and um, treats people using CBTs. So one, one thing I would say to this question and to everybody is that um, from a psychologist perspective, CBT is not one thing. CBT is, is no more one thing than is antidepressant medication only one thing, right? There are many antidepressant medications. There are actually many CBTs. And a, a kind of modern way to think about CBT in general and for misophonia is that it's a family of interventions. And you might wanna put an S at the end, CBTs plural instead of CBT singular, where CBTs are really a family of interventions that are evidence-based and can be used across various different diagnostic presentations. Now, to be really short and sweet given our time, the C in CBT is the cognitive part where there's an emphasis on doing something with thoughts. And what Dr. Prabhu has been talking about is really a traditional cognitive therapy C in CBT. And that is where you know, the idea is if you change the way you think, other things should change. But actually there's other ways to do CBTs where you're not trying to change what you think, but instead are trying to change how you experience your thoughts. Let me differentiate. So the changing the content of what you think is really traditional cognitive reappraisal or cognitive restructuring. Changing the content of what you think. In contrast, there are other cognitive interventions in CBTs that don't do that. That instead try to change the context 
of how you think. And that's where you see things like mindfulness and acceptance-based interventions woven into the family of CBTs. Now, how do you use all that for misophonia? That's a whole other webinar. We've given, we've given that webinar before and we'll do it again. And we've written about it and we'll keep writing about it. Um, but the idea I'm making for this comment here is that there are actually lots of ways to, to, to work with people's thoughts to help them experience them differently and be less reactive to them. And all of those kinds of interventions in the family of CBTs, all of them can be potentially applied in helping a patient with misophonia. And you just have to kind of, as a clinician, I have to think through with that patient, which of these interventions are they most interested in learning and doing? Is it a more changing the content, cognitive reappraisal way? Is it a more changing the context of how to experience cognitive and the word I'll use is diffusion, cognitive diffusion way. These are two very different types of interventions, two different mechanisms of change. They're all they're both within CBTs. Patient choice is really what drives what do you do there as a clinician. The best treatment there is the one that my client or patient is willing to do. It's not the one I say, it's what they say. Those are my, my two cents on that, on that comment. Um, Okay, so let's move to uh, another question here. We've got a couple, three minutes, so we'll try to be real quick here with the last three minutes. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, um, this comes from someone who is a clinician, and she says that she works with children and families. Many referred to her with misophonia. What is the youngest age you suggest a parent to take their child to an audiologist for testing? Yeah, so the youngest age... Uh, for a pure tenodiometry, we can uh, do it even for a, a three-year-old or a four-year-old child, but especially for doing an uncomfortable level where we are interested in identifying the comfort level of the child knows to say it is uncomfortable or not. So we do it through other methods. The child, the child would be pointing at a picture and all that. So around at least five years is what the age that I would recommend. I think from five years onwards, I think... Uh, audiologists should be able to definitely uh, assess the uh, assess the tests that I just recommended. Thank you. And 30 seconds or less, last question. Would the treatment of hyperacusis improve misophonia? I, I don't think so. So both are going, uh, I mean, the the pathophysiology could be slightly similar, similar, but the way we treat them could be totally different. So we cannot, the approaches that are used for mesophonia, hyperacusis is more kind of an exposure therapy where desensitization is what we work in. And that is not really recommended for mesophonia. So uh, they are both a parallel approaches is what I suggest. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for everything in this last hour, Dr. Prabhu. Thank you for your work and your dedication. And thank you for your training of clinicians in audiology uh, in India and elsewhere to be interested in this, to write about this and study this and, and give presentations. Thank you for, for really um, being so actively engaged in this community. Um, everybody appreciates it. And, and uh, we hope that you continue this for a long career uh, and, and help discover all sorts of insights about misophonia. So. Thank you, sir. Grateful to you. Um, our next webinar is intended to be, if you want to save the date, Wednesday, October 25th from 12 to 1 on Zoom. We're going to focus on what makes triggers triggering. Why these sounds? Why are these sounds the sounds that people hear triggering? What about the associated triggers that are not sounds? And what can we do about it? So we'll see you all there. Take care, everyone, and thank everyone for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you.